Coach Ciano. Now, I don't need to go through Coach's resume. You already know uh, the historic things that he's done. We already know his work ethic, his relentless pursuit of excellence. He will rebuild this program to the standard of excellence he set when he was here. He will exceed those past successes, and we will all celebrate together. So I'm not going to talk about Greg Schiano, the coach. I want to talk for a minute about Greg Schiano, the molder of men. I've had many, many conversations with folks over the past few weeks, but two in particular stand out. I had lunch one day in my office with Ryan Hart, Brian Leonard, and Anthony Calley. They didn't come in to talk to me about wins and losses and how he's a coach and what he does on the field. They didn't want to talk about being a great CEO of a program and better than other coaches that we might interview. They talked about how they wouldn't be the men they are today if it wasn't for Coach Shiano. They talked about the way they approach life, how they treat their families, the integrity that they bring to their professions, how they approach everything using the lessons they learned here at Rutgers under Coach Shiano. Incredibly powerful. What a great testament to the effect of one person on hundreds of young men. The second conversation was with Eric Legrand. Eric's over here. Eric didn't talk about how Coach helped him during that great time of tragedy. He talked about how Coach helped his family get through that tragedy. Eric had the strength Coach instilled in him on the practice field, in competition, and in the locker room. The Legrand family needed all of Eric's strength, and they needed all of Coach's strength. Eric is such an important part of our Rutgers family. And Eric, you and I had a phone call last week. You were a little down. I have a sense you're feeling really good today. <laughs> On Monday, we met with the team for the first time. I wish everyone could have heard Coach's address. Our students were sitting up, eyes forward, listening to every word. What they heard is that this team is going to be about character and integrity. Coach told them there aren't going to be a lot of rules. Everyone knows the right thing to do. It's going to be about family, F-A-M-I-L-Y. What does that mean? Forget about me, I love you. And that was repeated over and over in the room. We talked about selfishness and love for one another and how that love for one another is going to translate into success after success, not just during their time here at Rutgers, but beyond. Second, he talked about trust, being honest, doing the right thing at the right time. You could have heard a pin drop in the room, this room, our team room. And the last thing he spoke about applies to all of us as well. Every day and every moment, we will be laser focused, swinging that ax as hard as we can at everything we do. And as long as we keep chopping, the results will come. That's Greg Schiano, the man. That's Greg Schiano, our coach. Now, coach cannot do this alone. All of us, me, my administration, the university, our students, our alumni, and our fans need to start chopping. I couldn't be more excited about bringing Greg and Christy Schiano back to the banks. So all of us, let's keep chopping and welcome Coach Schiano. This is going to be great. Well, it's great to be home. It really is. Um, I have a lot of thank yous. It starts with uh, my gut. I thank God for the opportunity to come back here to Rutgers and the platform that it, it's going to give me and our coaching staff with our players. To watch them go from being young men to walking out the door as grown men. 
I want to thank my, uh, my family, starting with my wife, Christy. She is, uh, she's everything. She's my rock. She's my best friend. She's my confidant. She doesn't call plays, but she really does do everything else. And she did an incredible job raising our four kids because, as Pat had mentioned, there's a lot of sacrifice in this business. So I love you and thank you. We've got four great kids. My oldest son, Joey, who's just finishing up his career at Bucknell. Um, Matt and John, who are up in Amherst, I'm sure, watching this right now. And our daughter, Katie, who's back in Columbus. Um, all those guys, make sure you get back to class when this is over. I have a lot of people in the state of New Jersey, the state of Rutgers, that need to be thanked. I think it starts first with our governor, Governor Murphy. I can't tell you how grateful I am that you're here. To have a governor this involved and this supportive of Rutgers and Rutgers football, it's incredible. And it's going to be one of the reasons that this thing goes the way we all know it's going to go. Thank you. President Barchi, I want to thank you for getting this done. I know it wasn't easy. I know it really challenged a lot of things that we have done here in the past. I give you my word, you're going to be proud. Wherever you're sitting, wherever you're watching, you're going to be really, really proud of what these kids do, what these coaching staff does, what this school does. We'll be a part of this university. That's what we will be. So thank you. The Board of Governors, I just want to thank everybody for their incredible support. I know that uh, it took a lot of work, a lot of time to come to this conclusion, and I'm very, very grateful. To Greg and Anna Brown, we were just talking before we came in here. I met Greg 19 years ago, right back in that office. He walked in, and from that point, Greg and Anna and Christy and I would become very, very close, and their support has been unparalleled. And not just support like everybody thinks financially or serving on the board, but Greg's a true friend, a confidant, someone that I have grown very close to. So, Greg, thanks. And please give Anna our thanks as well. Pat Hobbs, watch out for us together. I'll tell you right now, we're going to make this thing special, and I can't wait to do it with you. So, shoulder to shoulder, as Mr. Brown said, shoulder to shoulder, here we go. I can't wait to do it. <laughs> Pat mentioned it, but I'm going to mention it. I want to thank, first off, our players. Because I had my phone. I was at my Twins game or at Joey's game every weekend this fall. And I had my phone watching the Rutgers games. So I'd be watching the Rutgers games and watching the kids. Watching the Rutgers games. And what I saw is a group of kids that were in a very tough situation, continued to get better and better. And that doesn't happen by accident. Nunzio, Nunzio Campanelli did an incredible job, incredible job. And we would text back and forth, and I was really excited for him because he's an excellent coach. He will be a head coach in major college when it's said and done. But he kept this group together, and he kept them fighting. And that is not easy to do if you follow sports. That is not easy to do in the situation they were. So, nuns, I really appreciate what you did. Eric, you got my back. I know that, and you know I always got your back. And if we don't, Miss Karen's going to knock us both out, so I got you. And last but not least, I want to thank our fans. The incredible show of support the show of our passion. That was awesome. That's what New Jersey's about. And that's what's going to allow us to do the things we're going to do. Now, I want to talk now. I don't want to uh, have a press conference. I want to talk to everyone in our great state of New Jersey. What just transpired was an incredible effort by our university. You can't say anymore that Rutgers is not all in. Rutgers is all in. Now it's our turn. It starts with me, our players, our fans, our boosters. Everybody's got to go all in because here's the problem. 
We entered the Big Ten Conference a few years ago. And the teams that we're looking up at right now, they're not waiting for Rutgers. Hey, guys, come on, catch up. No, that ain't happening. They're moving. I used to say we're chasing a moving target. Now I'm going to say it this way. We got to pass a moving target. And those are big targets. And it's going to take every single person. Everyone. So, yeah, if you got a lot of money, we need your money. Make no mistake about it. But if you don't have a lot of money, we need you at that scarlet walk on those kids who battle their rear ends off. We need you there. We need that packed. We need you in that stadium. We need that stadium packed because those kids lay it on the line. And we don't need it, with all due respect, we don't need it when we're seventh in the country, fifth in the country, first in the country. We need it right now. Not the beginning of the season. We need it right now. When you're around the water cooler, you're around the coffee machine at work, we need you promoting Rutgers football. Those block R magnets, they got to be on your car. We have to create the importance, every single one of us. That has to happen. Again, we're chasing some big dudes. No, we're passing. That's what we got to do. We ain't chasing, we're passing. And that's got to happen. And it's going to take every single one of us to do it. But the real beauty of this thing, People in New Jersey know how to work. They're not afraid of work, not afraid to get after it. But we collectively showed what can happen. That's got to be our leaping off point. We can't do this because it's just starting. Here we go. It's really important now that we all come together. Collectively here on campus, collectively in the state of New Jersey. New Jersey's always been a place, and I said this 19 years ago, it's always been a place, North Jersey, South Jersey. Well, you know what? When we really had it cranking here, there was no division. There was no division in high school football, and there was no division on what there was. New Jersey, look, they got the Giants and the Jets. You got the Eagles, right? I get it. You have two major cities that, that border, the, border our state. There's one thing that's all about just us, and that's Rutgers. And it's Rutgers University, Rutgers Athletics, and Rutgers Football. So we have a great opportunity to join everybody together, and that's what we need to do. All right, our program, what's it going to be built on? It's not real complicated. Pat alluded to it. It's going to be built on love. And you may say, well, that's not very tough talk for a, for a football coach. Love is sacrifice. Know what the word means. Love isn't a feeling. Love is an action. We could say we're going to build the program on being great teammates. That's what love is. But you can also say we're going to build it on coaches who love players. We're going to build it on players who love coaches. There's not going to be division. We're all in this together. That's what it's going to be built on. And when you have that feeling, you get exponential growth. That's what we're going to have to do. Again, because the challenge, the hill is steep. But that's what we need to do, and that's what we will do. I met with the players, as Pat had mentioned. We got a great group of players. Do we have to improve? Sure we do. But you know, I look over at that wall when I'm talking to our football team, and there's Devin McCourty. Now he's gonna run out of fingers to put Super Bowl rings on. Devin was a two star. He wasn't a five star, he was a two star. Devin didn't have a bunch of offers. I don't know if he had any division one offers. Well, Jason's over there. Well, Jason had maybe a couple. Players that are out there that are watching, that are listening, that are going to read, understand one thing. We are going to develop you at Rutgers. We're going to develop you as men. We're going to develop you as football players. Right? It's a total experience here that's built on love. Pat mentioned the chop. When we got good and it got exciting here, everybody did this, and I'm not sure everybody knows what this means. As an assistant coach, I sat in a meeting room, and there was a sports psychologist by the name of Kevin Elko. We were 3-3 three and three at the University of Miami, and we thought we might get fired. And that's before the great run occurred there. And we were going up to play Boston College, and he said, you guys, you're in the middle of the woods, and it's pitch dark and it's cold. And you got two choices. You can curl up and die, or in essence, get fired, or you can pick up an ax, pick one tree, look at the spot on that tree, and grab that ax as tight as you can and haul off and hit that spot.
but it's not going to do much. You got to look at that spot with great focus and great concentration and do it again and do it again and do it again. And eventually, four or five hundred st strokes later, you're going to start to hear something. Poof. That's when you take a rest, pat yourself on the back, and then pick a new tree and start on that. And pretty soon, that dark forest, a little light starts to show. You keep doing it, before you know it, you're where you want to be. That's the way it's going to work. And I'm going to make no mistake about it because I've never done anything in my life, anything other than to be the very best. So when I stood up here 19 years ago and I said, Rutgers football will be national champions, I got a lot of laughs, a lot of smirks. A lot of people said, oh, yeah, yeah. We got to number seven. We couldn't do it. A lot of water under the bridge since then. Don't laugh. I'm not saying it's going to be overnight. We know that. It's going to take a lot of hard work, a lot of great coaches, a lot of great players. We have university support. But I would never ask a player to sit in one of these seats, go down in that weight room, go out on that field, if it wasn't to be the very best. That is our goal, and it will never change. To hoist the national championship trophy and be number one in the country, to be the best. So that's what it's going to take. It's going to take everybody in this state, everybody who cares about Rutgers and cares about New Jersey, to pick up the axe, look at the spot, and just start chopping. And don't worry about what happens next. Just look at the spot and keep hitting it until that tree falls. I'm thrilled to be back. Can't wait to get this done. Thank you. Uh, is this a more um, daunting task than the, the rebuilding job that you inherited in 2000? In some ways, probably. In other ways, no. You know, we're sitting in this meeting room here. Um, I can remember Bob Mulcahy, our athletic director. When we came here, he said, we're going we're gonna to build an addition onto this building. I said, Bob, we need to. And we did it, right? So we're sitting in, in, in a better facility than we were. You go to those practice fields, that's certainly a lot better than we had with the light poles falling down, right? That weight room. I mean, we, we are definitely well ahead. I'll tell you this, and this will be a good little story for everybody. So our, we would alternate going to the Twins game or going to Joey's game. And uh, one night, we were going to fly into Albany to go up to Williams College. And I said to Christy, it was right in the middle of this stuff, and I said to Christy, why don't we fly into Newark and just take a ride around Rutgers? Because if this thing works out, I want to see what, you know, I haven't been back in a long time. So I got a hat, and this is silly, right? And glass, I had my reading glasses on, and I kind of walked like this through the airport so no one would see me. And we came down, and I drove around, and I went on the Livingston campus, and I didn't even know where I was. It's unbelievable what, what you have accomplished, the buildings you've put up, unbelievable. So I'm like, wow. Because I'm going to tell you the truth, when we used to recruit, we never even told them there was a Livingston campus, okay? So then I go, well, let's go down College Apple, see what's down there. And we're driving around, I'm like, oh, this is beautiful, look at this. Where the seminary used to be, there's all those beautiful buildings. Then we get down to the end, and I see the big clock on the new bookstore. And I look to my right, and there's this unbelievable, and it was a Friday night, and there was action, and there was energy. I'm like, I said to her, I turned to Chris, and I said, Oh, I hope this works. I mean, we, we, did, we recruited these players with nothing. I mean, literally, it was a great academic school, but it wasn't like, to, compared to other campuses, we kind of hid the campus. Now I can't wait to get our recruits out on that campus, show them proud, stand up and say, look at this, look at that, because there's no place nicer. I'm telling you right now, it is beautiful. So to answer your question, I think we're in better position to make our move, and uh, I can't wait to do it. Coach, with less than uh, one month left until early signing period, how do you plan to attack recruiting for 2020 on short time? It's going to be very difficult, uh, Todrick. I'm going to tell you right now, we have literally, counting today, eight school days left. 
So when we're done, we're going to do some things here, and then I'm heading out to see some players. Um, and we just got to do that. We've been on the phone with players just constantly. And you know what? We're not going to rush and just fill up guys to say we sign guys. That's not what we're going to do. We're going to take guys that are Rutgers men, guys that we know love the game of football, because when they love football, then all the other stuff that maybe they're not so motivated to do, they're going to do it because they know the coach they play for. You take care of business, otherwise you don't get to go do what you love. And that's, that's been the way we do it, right? And I'm not going to tell you, you know, I love coaches who say, oh, I treat everybody the same. Well, if you do, that's crazy because they don't treat you the same. I treat everybody fair. But there's a certain level that every player on the team must, must accomplish, must do. And that's, that's it. There's no exceptions to that. I don't care. You know, it didn't matter if it was Brian Leonard or Ray Wright. It didn't matter who it was. They were going to do this. Now, you are an equity. That's the way it works in the real world, right? So when you build equity and you have a little mishap, I can, okay, we'll get that fixed. When you don't have much equity, it's not that easy. So we're going to go out and find players that want to be here. Does that make sense? Sarah Sullivan from the Boston Globe. Um, Greg, I wanted to ask you about your time away from the college game in particular, obviously going back to Tampa, but even more recently in New England. When you left the NFL behind, like what did you, in that time, what did you learn about yourself or why did you do that and what is it about the college game in particular that brought you back here? Well, I'll tell you, it's, um, since I left here eight years ago, a lot has happened and some of that's been in pro football. I learned a ton. I've been humbled. Um, but you know, the people that you really know got your back, like Bill Belichick. I started working there and I loved working there, but I just felt um, coaching is a very selfish business. And like I said earlier, my wife, Christy, she raised our kids and I tried to jump in when I could. And I just felt like it had been about me for 30 years and it was time to, uh, to work on myself a little bit and spend time with my children and my wife. And it was the best eight months that I've had. But you know what? I had a boss in Bill Belichick who is a true friend and he was awesome. He understood and he gave me his blessing. And that's really what made it easy to, easier to do. Uh, I'll always cherish those memories. But as I reflected over those eight months, I realized that uh, what I've been put on earth, what I've been blessed to do is not only coach the game of football, but use it as a platform to, to take young men and turn them into grown men and put them out there. You know, I always tell parents when we recruit their sons, You're not, your job's not done, but we're going we're gonna to help you finish the process. And the only reason we're recruiting your son is we believe in him as a young man. So we're going to make sure that he finishes his development and we're going to be the, the, the parents away from home. And I think, I think that's something that I'm blessed with, my wife, with the players, and, uh, and really the staff we're going to put together. That's, that's a key component. A lot of the stuff you say sounds like the Greg Giano from the 2000s, 2006, which is great. How have you... In the time, though, that you've been in the NFL as a head coach, been in a national powerhouse like Ohio State, how have you changed as a head coach? The, the athletes, I'm sure, have changed. The student athletes have changed in that time as well. Well, there's no doubt a lot's changed, right? I mean, social media alone is a whole world that didn't exist. So being able to adapt to that stuff, I think, like I mentioned in Tara's question, you know, when you're humbled a little bit, you, you really reflect on... You know, where could I have been better? I always think when, when things don't go right, you need to look at your first, you know, in the mirror first. And what, what could I have done better? Um, there's a saying that, I, that I've really tried to stick to in the last five years or so, and that's keep the main thing the main thing. I think a lot of times you can get worried about every single thing. And, and yeah, sure, everything's important, but if everything's important, nothing's important. And I think I've learned that I'm in charge of the main thing, and I got to keep focused on the main thing. There are going to be other people that can take care of other stuff, but when someone trusts their son with me, I got four kids. Anybody messes with my kids, that's going to be a bad day, right? Well, when they trust their kid with me, 
I got a big, big responsibility, and I got to make sure I keep my focus on them. So players is probably, not probably, players is the biggest focus, whereas the first time around, it was plays, it was schemes, it was techniques. I'll hire really, really good coaches, and they're going to they're gonna be excellent at that. And I'll help because I have 30 years of experience, but I, I have a responsibility to those parents. I got your son. I ultimately am in charge, so I got your son, and I got to make sure that I carry that out. And that's probably the biggest, not that I didn't do that, but I think my, my, my focus is even going to be more on that this second go around. CTV. Greg, in December of 2000, you said this program will be built on a rock foundation. It will take longer than building it on stilts, but when it's built, it will be built forever. So what's your message December of 2019 regarding building this program again? It's a really good question, Bruce. Um, I'm a little disappointed because we said it would be built forever, and, and now we're here we stand, right? So I need to alter a few things because there's going to come a day when I'm not the coach here anymore. And just as I, I, I told, I think I told Pat and Greg both this, the last eight years, I, I followed Rutgers. That was my team. Now, I didn't let everybody know that, but whether I was coaching in the NFL, I, I checked the scores, I read the stories. I always wondered and wanted to know what ha what's happening at Rutgers. And I'd be lying if I didn't tell you I got disappointed when things didn't go well. We need to, we need to adjust a few things because we do need to build this program to last. The state of New Jersey deserves that. Rutgers University deserves that. So we're going to have to adjust some things. But it will be built to last. I promise you that. Uh, Coach David Cruz, NJTV News. Um, Governor Murphy's predecessor uh, did not speak well of you. He, he compared you unfavorably to Bear Bryant and Urban Meyer and said that you're an unemployed football coach who now wants taxpayers of the state to pay for his private air travel. Feeling welcomed? I am. Yeah, I am welcome. Look, Chris and I, we go back a long way, and we're, we're fine. I, I take no offense. People are going to say things. I know this, that he wants what's best for New Jersey, too, and uh, we'll be fine. Not a problem. Sports, welcome back. You spent some time with, uh, excuse me, you spent some time with Urban Meyer. What did you really take away from that experience uh, as a coach? Well, it was really unique because Urban is a good friend of mine, like really good friend, very, very close. And, uh, you know, initially there was no way I was going to go be an assistant. You know, I'm not going to go be it. But he is one of the more persuasive people that I've ever met. And what I learned working there for three years, I thought that I was the hardest working coach in recruiting, right? And I learned that I wasn't. And I learned some ways to be a better recruiter. And uh, if I said one thing, I, I would take that away from my time, is that there's certain things you can do to really exponentially pop your recruiting. So I'm excited to do that, because we did a good, pretty good job here recruiting. But uh, that's the life, lifeline of your program. And uh, you know, I learned a lot of stuff. And I hope he learned some stuff from me. You know, we're, we're really good friends. But that would be the biggest thing. Coach, we're going to take a couple more. We're going to go here. OK. Greg, Tom Canavan with the Associated Press. Thank you, sir. Oh, oh, good. Sorry. I'm old. Um, ten days ago, the university put out a statement saying talks are dead. What happened? What was your initial feeling when that happened? And what changed to make the talks end up where we are today? Well, I thank God that they did. I really do. Um, and I prayed for that to happen. You know, I really. But that that's what happened right there. Those those people and several more. Um, and me too, right? I think there's never been a moment where all of us didn't want the same thing because this is, this is a top flight university, period. So everything that's associated with it needs to be that, right? I think sometimes you go through things and there's different ways, there's definitely different ways to skin the cat. We know that. And I think what happened is we really communicated well. When it, when it looked like it might be going off the rails, I, I'm not gonna lie, I was very disappointed. Very disappointed, and even more so after we took that little secret trip and saw how beautiful the place has really become. Um, but I was hopeful 
and these men here and some other people, you know, that, uh, you know, that, that, that helped me out um, really, really did a great job. And I, I, I should, it reminds me, I do, I want to thank uh, Jimmy Sexton and his group because they did an incredible job on our, on our part helping get this thing to the goal line as well. So I think it was a collection of really smart people that decided this is what's best. So let's, uh, let's find a way to get it done. Roger kind of NJ.com. Coach, you were known as a pro style and a 4-3 guy the first time around. Will that change this time around? And if so, how will the type of personnel you recruit change from the past? Well, that, I think that goes back to Tara's question again. You know, what did I learn in those eight years and in pro football? The one thing about pro football that's different, it's a matchup game. I mean, everything is about matchups. So we are going to have to really, really take advantage of that. So schemes, you know, you got 11 guys. It's not... We're not talking about rocket science here. You got 11 guys. You got to figure out where to put them. You got to give them a chance to be successful. And, and coaching football is that simple. It's not easy, but it's very simple. So we have to make sure that we have flexibility to fit the personnel we have. So to say we're pro style or we're a spread team or an RPO team or a 4 3 or a 3 4, it doesn't matter. The thing that matters, we'll, we'll do whatever it takes to win. What matters is that our players love each other that they're willing to put it on the line for each other. They're willing to play incredibly hard. You know, football is not a natural game. You go to a family picnic, they play pickup hoops, they play wiffle ball. No one goes and puts a hard shell helmet on and then runs into somebody. That's just not natural. So when you get players that do that, right, they got to have something inside of them that they're doing it for. And the most important thing that our players and our coaches do it for each other. When they do that, we can make Rutgers proud, we can make New Jersey proud. Greg, James Cratch, NJ.com. The offense has been near the bottom nationally the last four years. You're going to probably have your 11th offensive coordinator in 11 years. What is your vision for the offense? How do you fix that going forward? Well, I just, you know, like I just said, I don't think to call it a name because I don't want to do that. You look at the team that won the most Super Bowls and is the best organization ever in, in pro sport. One week, the Patriots will run the ball 50 times and throw it, you know, 14. Flip the next week, they throw it, uh, run it 14 and throw it 50. I mean, you, we're going to do what it takes to win. Now, offensively, what I believe and how I've grown, I think you have to make teams defend you sideline to sideline. So we're not going to be – if you get in tight, there's a reason. We want to make them defend 53 and a third, and we also want to make them defend deep. So if that gives you a little insight, it's going to be people all over the place and make the defense – because as a defensive coach – I hate when they do that to you, right? So we're going we're gonna to make people do that, and we're going to hire a staff that's experts at doing those things, both offensively, defensively, and in the kicking game. And that's really, really important to me because uh, they need to do their job. I need to let them do their job, and I need to make sure I do my job. That's going to be the key. I want to, you know, is we good? I just want to say, we again, we need everybody's help. You have a job to do. We have a job to do, but if anybody in this great state of New Jersey is listening, we need everybody to galvanize. You did it. You did something incredible, but now we need to take it to the next level, to the next level. We need to focus on that spot, and we need to chop away. I really appreciate everybody coming out here today. I thank you.